Hi there, welcome to the Non-Serbian Podcast. I'm Lucy Steigerwald, and um, my guest over at his house in uh, Maryland is Jesse Walker, who is the books editor of Reason Magazine, and he is the author of uh, Rebels on the Air, which I haven't read, and United States of Paranoia, which I totally have read. Um, but thanks for coming on to talk, Jesse. Well, I am happy to be back. Or I don't know if I should say back. I, I was on your other your other podcast once or twice, but not this one. Yes, many years ago, the awkward YouTube podcast. This is new. This is classy, an anarchist. We're very deep here on non servium. Um, <laughs> I know Jesse. Uh, I had Korean food with him not two weeks ago, so we'll be very relaxed and casual, but deeply informative. I'm just gonna hype it up a lot. Um, I guess I want to start out the usual sort of what have you been doing lately? And, um, you showed me a little piece you did for the June reason magazine about, um, the oath keepers and, uh, quasi militia. Not exactly. I don't know how to define them. I guess I can ask you that. Um, and Stuart Rhodes. And since you're kind of the paranoia guy, I'm wondering if you can, t- can tell me. I guess what Oath Keepers are and kind of how you see they've changed in the last um, decade, I guess. Yeah. First of all, thank you for calling me the paranoid guy. I should get, <laughs> should get cards made that say that. Re- replace my old ones that say freelance sultan. Um, <laughs> there, Yeah. So the Oath Keepers were started in 2009 um, by Stuart Rhodes, uh, who is now, who was recently um arrested in connection with his alleged role on, in the Capitol riot. We have to use the word alleged a lot right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, he was there. Um, and uh, anyway, he started them. And, and he did some sort of writing prior to that about what was on his mind that led him up to starting it. Um, it a lot of people sort of assume it was just a reaction to the Obama administration. But the it really kind of began, I don't know, began is the right word. He, he was writing stuff about the um, federal response to Katrina, which I think is what really um, set the um, set the thought process moving. And the original idea of the organization, which evolved considerably since then, um, was that they were going to recruit a bunch of cops and soldiers and say, um, here is a list of orders we will not obey, unconstitutional orders. We will refuse to uh, crack down in these ways if we are ordered to, um, you know, suppress people's civil liberties. And they had like a list of 10 commands they wouldn't follow. Um, And uh, so this was sort of a classic bit of, political, like nonviolent action. I, they, there was, they were initially sort of received as this kind of um, uh, violent group, which ultimately they became, but let's not get too far ahead of the story. Um, but the original idea was like this sort of classic Gene Sharp, um, lay down your arms, refuse to obey um, the commands of the, uh, of the authorities when those commands overstep their rightful, um, their uh, rightful boundaries. So, the question then becomes, how did he get, we get from there to him, Stuart Rhodes and a number of other Oath Keepers participating in the Capitol riot, participating in planning beforehand, having this kind of elaborate scheme for uh, a, a reaction team or whatever the phrase was, I don't have my story in front of me, um, that was going to have weapons if they needed to be brought over. Um, it's a scheme that kind of like didn't work out at all. What they planned is not really what went down because on top of everything else, these were not the most competent revolutionaries in the world. Um, but, and, and I sort of talked about two things that changed. One is that there was just the kind of um, evolution of the group's mission. Um, so starting in 2013, they started forming armed cells, which the idea originally was they were going to train people to communities to kind of defend themselves and, and respond to emergencies themselves. They don't, they don't have to rely on the government, not a bad, innately bad idea at all. Um, but it did kind of introduce a new relationship between the Oath Keepers and their weapons. Um, and there was a quote from Rhodes's estranged wife to the Los Angeles Times a year or so ago, where, where she said they were running around playing army now. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, uh, after that, they kind of, um, they started doing a lot of security work at rallies where people on 
the right were worried about Antifa or other such forces um, getting into scraps with them, um, playing sort of a similar role to what some groups like Redneck Revolt were doing on the left back when um, when Redneck Revolt was a thing. Um, but it, 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 obviously there's um, there's a sort of evolution uh, in what they were doing. And I can go into other details, but I mean, like there was this kind of shift from just the original, we will lay down our arms. And then the other thing was, um, you know, a lot of them, you know, were became Trump supporters. Um, they became more afraid of the left than they were of the state. Um, they were more afraid of Antifa than they were of, you know, the the... They were afraid of the "quote unquote" deep state because they thought it might be aligned with Antifa and working to undermine Trump. But you know, I mean, I mean, this is a group that had like supported you know the Snowden links and leaks and stuff like that in the past. So that was part of what the, their makeup. But um, it reached a point, sort of, that during the twenty twenty um, during the George Floyd movement, um, the protests and sometimes riots that were happening around the country, um, Rhodes was urging. Um, you know, President Trump to uh, declare it an insurrection and, and send in the gendarmes to uh, suppress it. Um, and, and, you know, what I ended my piece was saying, you know, Trump didn't um, do the, uh, the, the advice that Stuart Rhodes sent him. Um, there was repression, but not on the level Rhodes was asking for. Um, but if, if he had, I sure hope some of those, uh, you know, people in the National Guard would remember their oath and lay down their arms rather than obey any unconstitutional orders. So I, I, I did this piece in part because, you know, I, I wrote a, um, stuff about the Oath Keepers a little more than a decade ago when they were starting that was pointing out that this was a Gene Sharpian idea more than your kind of, you know, para, classic paramilitary idea, pushing back against some of the, um, uh, you know, the, the reactions that were treating them in 2009 and 2010, like the group they were in 2022, um, which I still think was not the right way to respond to them. It'd be like writing about SDS in 1962 as though they were already the weathermen, you know? Um, but it, it's a, um, but over the years, you know, I've, I've covered um, some of these developments um, and I, I tell a story or two. I probably would go too deep into the weeds about that. And I had, and sometimes we just sort of web stories on on things that happen. Sometimes with passing um, remarks and stories about other things like border militias, I, I noted the way they evolved, and especially on Twitter, I, I was, got a lot more critical of the organization. But I had not written something that sort of said, "All right, what happened? Right. Um, you know, what changed? How did it change? Um, were the seeds there from the beginning, or or, or was this something new? I think, you know, a bit of both, probably." Um, and so that, so this is in the, um, June issue of reason it's called, I think the decline and fall of the oath keepers. You've got it in front of you. That's the most recent thing I have out. It like was just mailed to subscribers as we're speaking, like a couple of days ago. I don't know when this is going up. Um, I think my subscription may have lapsed. Yeah. Well, I swear it's not I, on a spike. I emailed you the PDF so we could have this conversation. Um, okay. Well, there's a lot there. Part of it, I guess. But I mean, I already kind of know your take on the idea that like when um, the Oath Keepers came to people's attention, Democrats and uh, let's say the left, but mainly more moderate Democrats were hysterical, to use a not very nice word about their reaction. Um, And then like kind of getting into your United States of paranoia, which I haven't read since uh, it came out, which is 2014. So like, I don't know if you can like sort of sum it up for people, but also kind of talk about, you know, did like what, you know, did your book to me is sort of a gentle, uh, sort of a a defense of paranoia and a deeper look at it beyond just like people who are paranoid, you know, is it's irrational and sort of just sort of what I think of as simplistic critiques. And I guess like, the feeling that paranoia and conspiracy has gotten worse since you've written that book, obviously since the Trumpy days, which somehow are still going on. It feels like, um, like, and whether conspiracy theories metastasized or if 
were you wrong at all, you know, about, about like the consequences of paranoia and stuff? Like, how do you reevaluate your book? No, I mean, I, I, I think I, the book is supposed to be kind of a toolkit for people to understand what happened after the book. And I think it works as a toolkit. Um, there are things I would have done differently. Like when I discussed the birthers, I probably should have mentioned Trump. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I mean, I, I, I didn't absolutely need to, I had quotes from other people, but now I feel like, ah, it would have been nice if I had mentioned <laughs> Trump somewhere in this book, you know? Um, but I, where people have disliked, well, cause I, at the end, in the last chapter, I talk a bit about, um, the, um, the reaction to, you know, the far right, um, both the actual far right and some groups that were perceived as far right, um, a decade ago during the, during the, te- the tea party era. Mm-hmm. Um, and this kind of mirroring that happens where you've got groups formulating conspiracy theories about, um, the powers that be, and then the powers that be formulating conspiracy theories about, um, you know, these paranoids that are out to get me. Um, and it's a, uh, and the pushback that I've gotten has mostly been from people who did not see some of the distinctions I drew. I mean, I drew a distinction between the militia right and, um, you know, the uh, what we would now call the alt right. You know, the sort of. I mean, at the time, sure. the, the word, the term existed, um, but it was not used in precisely the same way. I mean, the sort of white nationalist, um, overtly. Um, racist or gender obsessed, right? Um, mm-hmm. Which was much more prone um, to violence um, and to various other issues. And of course, things have evolved. There are groups that have drifted in one direction or the other since then, and there's been intersections. Um, and I, uh, you know, history has continued to unfold. Um, it will do that. Yeah, it, it, it's it would be useful for me if everything had <laughs> stopped in 2013. Um, the um, but the um, and we can get into some some of that if, if you want to. I, I don't know if you want to do some pushback and I can answer it. But um, a lot of um, I would say that there's a there's a section I mentioned the discussion of the birthers. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I talked about um, the birthers as an example of what was going on. It was not basically when there was the transition from the Bush years to the Obama years, there was this sort of popular idea that conspiracy theorizing was suddenly taking off on the right. And I argue that what happened instead was a change in the direction that during the Bush years, there was a lot of conspiracy theories about um, the enemy outside the country, the the Muslims and the Mexicans trying to come in and do all those things that right wingers are afraid of. Um, and then um, there was a shift to being afraid of the government, of the enemy above. Um, and the, let's say, the relatively libertarian side of the right, you know, became more prominent, um, you know, in the Tea Party years than it had been um, under Bush and, for that matter, <laughs> under Trump. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was a, um, so there was that shift. But I also said that what was happening with the birthers was very different from that, that um, that this was um, this was a fear of Obama as himself being some sort of an alien contamination, um, and it's sort of a way of almost you know maintaining your respect for the system, for the um, for the uh, you know the social order, and just sort of um, saying, well, the people who are currently running the government are pretenders. Um, that and- is an ch- old chestnut, even when we're not talking about you know racist paranoia about. Hawaii not being really the U.S. and that sort of yeah, and well, the that's birther, true, birther course, stuff. Obviously, you know, Hawaii. That's not even in. The, <laughs> it's not even on an American continent. Come on. I mean, yeah, no, but yeah. So there was a um. So with that um, and what really I think I mean my argument it's a um would be you know you had your sort of Justin Amash side of the right and your Donald Trump side of the right um. <laughs> And the Trump side, the birther side, triumphed. You know, that's that's mm-hmm. what rose to power um, in 2015-16. Uh, and that's, uh, so I mean, that, and, you know, a lot of things followed from that. So if I had written another, cha- if I'd written this book 10 years later and written another chapter, and, and thank goodness I didn't, because that would be just structurally destroy <laughs> the book. Um, so uh, there, then, you know, that would be part of the uh, the story is how that happened on the right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that's continuing to this day. Um, it, I mean, that, that, that trend towards, I mean, I, I, I don't even want to put, um, 
Trump at the center of it now. I, I think it's independent of him. Um, I think it'll still be a big part of the Republican race in 2024 if he's not the candidate, you know, if it's DeSantis yeah. or someone else. So, yeah, you know, that that's uh, so, I mean, that's what and I think the Oath Keepers, um, they kind of followed that. I mean, they didn't go as far as they as it could go. I mean, they didn't get into the ra- you know racism and things like that. Um, I mean, Rhodes is part Mexican himself. So there is a um, I mean, but they did get into this sort of idea of being more afraid or at least of as afraid of the left as they are of the state and therefore being willing, you know, to call for these crackdowns in 2020 and to, you know, you know participate in this pathetic attempt to keep Trump in power in uh, at the beginning of 2021. Um, I'm reminded now of just the the weirdness of being a libertarian when with 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 Trump and the, like being the supposed enemy of like the deep so called deep state, and I guess I don't want to get too much into your book, but like I want I I, I would love people to know more about your enemy um, outside, enemy above, like that 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 whole categorization because that is really useful and informative beyond just like, I'm afraid of, of, of sort of, you know, this and that, and just generalized critique of, of generalized paranoia. It's not very useful because I've always been a defender of paranoia because, uh, I mean, this is an anarchist podcast and all. Um, but just like the, the, the idea of, of the most powerful man on the planet being in the supposed war against the national security state, basically, it doesn't make any goddamn sense at all. Um, I mean, but that's, that's, you know, it's been at the heart of all sorts of conspiracy stories in the past, you know, that Kennedy was secretly on our side and that's why they killed him. Sure. Or, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and there are, there is of course, skullduggery within the government, you know, you know, faction fights, you know, and the CIA facing off against the FBI for resources and influence and so on. Sure. Um, I will say, I mean, I would not call my book a defense of paranoia. I think you used that <laughs> phrase earlier. I, what I, what I, what I sort of, the two big themes are that, uh, although, I mean, I do talk about some conspiracies that were real. You have to, if you're in yeah, yeah. conspiracy theories. Um, I would say that the, uh, the theme that you're kind of getting at there is the one that even, when a conspiracy theory isn't true, if it catches on, it speaks to the anxieties and experiences of the people who believe and repeat it. Um, it know, must. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's a form of folklore. It still tells you something about, you know, the the sort of mental space we live in. Um, and it and it can be rooted in, in real problems. Sometimes it's rooted in other things. Um, but, you know, that's a um, and then the other you know big theme is that it's not limited to the fringes, um, you know, that it's. All, it has always been at the heart of, of power that, you know, the people atop the state and other powerful institutions um, have, you know, they also have conspiracy theories about um, outsiders, about people lower than them on the right. totem pole, and sometimes just from another wing of the totem pole, which is like right. sort of Trump versus the deep state thing. Um, so I, I guess, yeah, I mean, and, and I kind of talk about five you know, archetypal conspiracy narratives in practice, they often get mixed up together, you know, but there's the enemy. Tell us, at yeah. least give us like the, the quick. The enemy above is what people think of when they hear the phrase conspiracy theory, right. conspiracies in the government, big corporations, secret societies that allegedly control the government and big corporations, that sort of thing. I mean, that's usually what I think of too. I think I'm, you know, I try to be nuanced in life, but that is usually what I'm thinking of. Right. Enemy below is the fear of, um, of conspiracies to overturn the social order from, you know, the underclass or just anyone sort of below you doesn't have to be the underclass quote unquote, um, anyone below you in this sort of social totem pole. Um, and I get into, um, in the book about the antebellum era, the, the uh, slave owners having conspiracy theory, uh, having basically periodic pan- slave um, yeah. revolt panics where they were convinced that there was a plot afoot far more often than there was. Um, and then they having echoes many times long after. The, I mean, like I mean, with us recently, some of the conspiracy theories about, you know, the, the riots um, that we just saw, saw a couple uh, years ago. Um, enemy outside is the fear of the, um, the forces gathered outside the uh, the community's gates that wants to um, uh, insidiously take over and um, turn you into some version of them. Um, there's the enemy within, which is the opposite of that. There's the, the sort of classic pod people fear that, you know, the, the folks that look like 
look like you are in fact um, agents of some other force. I mean, the classic example there is the Salem witch trials, um, mm-hmm. but of course there have been many since then. And then the fifth is the idea of the benevolent conspiracy, which is a secret um, cabal working to make uh, the world better. Uh, which is often not included in these discussions, but there's a long I've history. I've forgotten that one too. What What's an example of, of that? Well, there's a lot of stuff in, um, in uh, you know, new age literature about, you know, the Rosicrucians or folks like that, you know, working to bring us to our higher selves, America have a, having a secret destiny. And ultimately, I mean, lots of religion functions this way. I mean, sure. you, you know, if someone says, you know, you know, the God has a plan for everything. I mean, if, say, if someone were to say, if something goes wrong in your life and someone says, well, it's all part of the great plan, that sounds incredibly paranoid. It could be taken <laughs> that way. Um, but what they usually mean is that, no, actually, it's going to work out for the better. There's this hidden force working behind the scenes to make things better. So you have these kind of secularized versions of that, where it's Rosicrucians or extraterrestrials. You have quasi, I mean, not really secularized, but no longer just you know, talking about God like sort of conspiracies of angels. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, So there's, you know, and this interacts in interesting ways with the other conspiracy theories because, um, (coughs) excuse me, you will have people writing, you know, a new age tract about the secret order that's helping the world. And then you'll have, um, you know, conservative Christians uh, who reading those um, books and using them as literature uh, I mean, as evidence in their literature saying, no, no, this is all, this is them admitting their plan, that it's bad, you know, and this happens in, 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 within Christianity. I mean, there's like a whole, I mean, there was that whole boom of angel books in the 1990s. And then the there was, 90s loved angels. And then there was this backlash where people say, no, the angels are really demons. Oh, careful, no. you know? oh that's not good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, honestly, this is making me think I'm going to need to to do a reread of your book. Um, I do. Would you ever consider updating it at all? Because some, uh, I was thinking, I was remembering that um, Gene Healy from the Cato Institute wrote uh, Call to the Presidency, which is essential, probably not as much for people listening to this podcast, but for like your average human, I sort of wish I could mandate reading it. But I, that came out like right before Obama was elected. So if you're talking about a cult of presidents, just not having Obama or Trump in your book seems sort of tragically uh, out of date yeah. now. I don't know. Have I you, don't you think about updating? I did a, um, so the book came out in 2013 and then there mm-hmm. was a paperback edition in 2014, which okay. had an afterword that sort of brought things up to date and, or, you know, at least talked about, you know, Snowden and some other stuff. And, now that afterward is the most outdated part of the book, you know, (laughs) it's like this sort of like weird dispatch from a year after I wrote it, you know, and it's, I, I don't regret it being there. I mean, fine. I wrote this little appendix, but it's, you know, what am I going to do? Just keep doing that over and over. I mean, the fact is that the last chapter of the book, not the epilogue, but the last sort of main chapter, the one that talks about the war on terror and the tea party era um, and some other stuff that happened in there, like the, Dan Brown phenomenon and that kind of thing um, is to my mind, the weakest part of the book because, you know, the book has a structure. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess and, my copy wouldn't have that because I have a hardback. Yeah. So the, the, um, I mean like this, you would have this one. This is like chapter 12. I think it's, it, it's the, um, it's not the, the um, paperback afterward. It's the weakest um, chapter because it's the one where it was really hard not to just have it be and here is everything that has happened since 2001 you know sure every other um the first half of the book is me laying out those five conspiracy archetypal narratives and giving distinct examples the second half of the book is me looking at history since um i mean basically the, the last uh, half century um you know with you know through the lens of that 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 first half of, of, of the book with that toolkit. But each chapter again is about like, a, is making a distinct point. Um, mm-hmm. it, it covers a part, you know, the, the Watergate era, the, the eighties, the, um, the period between the cold war and the, and the war on terror. But each one of those is, you know, is, is self-contained in a way that was sort of spilling out a bit in, in the, um, and that's because, yeah, I mean, it was easier to write it now because we're kind of in this era where we say, well, now, we're in the COVID era, the post neoliberal era, whatever you want to call it. You know, it's like that war on terror period. We can have a bit more, um, but it would have been um, 
it, it was, uh, I mean, I, I don't think I, I failed at it, but it was the most difficult to sort of keep um, together in a way that sort of tells a propulsive story and makes an argument and just adding on, you know, and here's what happened a few years later to me would just kind of destroy that. Um, mm-hmm. And this, I mean, there's something to be said for just writing about what happened in the Trump era with both the paranoia of the Trump people and the paranoia of the anti-Trump people, you know, a lot of the, you know, crazy Russia theories and so on. Um, but it, it's a, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel like that's quite, over yet you know I mean, no. that's, it, it would if i were to try to write that now um i would run into the same sort of problem that i had with the war on terror stuff even more of it because there's so many question marks about certain parts of the story you know what mm-hmm. actually happened and what didn't um so i'm kind of happy just to have my toolkit that i set out there i keep using that word and yeah. um, i periodically you know write articles you know about you know Trump's paranoia or what happened to the Oath Keepers or, um, or uh, what's happening with border militias or um, what's going on with, you know, Russia fears. I've done a couple on that, you know, uh, and tech fears and how these all intersect and feed into each other. But kind of never I'm, stops, I'm happy does not it? to be turning it into, you know, paranoia to you know, <laughs> return. But there's, there is enough for a sequel, though. I'm convinced of it. I mean, that... Yeah, a permanent human condition. I'm pretty sure, even if it feels somehow extra right now. But I know it felt like that, circa like 2010, 2011, when sort of Democrats were terrified of the backlash against Obama and, and sort of all that they yeah. decided that that meant. Um, I know that uh, some of our like our listeners, I guess, um, people you definitely know. Uh, kind of wanted to ask you some stuff. Um, I mean, uh, Nathan Goodman was just wanted to know if um, conspiracy theories are, are more pernicious or prevalent um, or, or if, if, if we kind of already did that, like what, like what is your favorite or most, um, what do you find, which one do you find most entertaining? Well, I will say, I, I don't think they're more prevalent. Um, I, I just to answer that, I, I think, um, there is, and this is actually one thing where it would have been nice to write my book um, a year or two later, because a book a year after my book came out, Joe Yasinski and Joe Parent wrote a book um, on conspiracy theories that included this mammoth study where they looked at every single letter to the editor of the New York Times from the 1890s up to like 2010, somewhere around there. Oh, wow. Plus a, um, plus so like a control group from one of the Chicago papers, um, not for the whole period, but to make sure you're not just getting... And they classified, you know, they counted all the conspiracy um, ones and uh, classified them and so forth. And it's a um, it's not a perfect measure of, you know, when there are sort of spikes in conspiracy theorizing. But it's, you know, the biggest big data I've seen. It's, it's certainly better than the kind of impressionistic um, stuff I have to write. about. Anyway, the big um, surges were in the 1890s with... Um, Corp- fears around corporate trusts and stuff like that sure. in the 1950s, the uh, you know, McCarthy era, early sure. red, uh, second red, well, not, I hate to say second red scare, post-war red scare, because uh, there were more than two. Um, <laughs> and there were some smaller ones around Watergate and so on. But mostly it's just kind of like, it's just kind of zigzagging. And it, it, if anything, there's a slight decline over time, um, including in the internet era. Although, of course, you can make arguments about, well, maybe people are just not sending this stuff to New York Times. I don't know. Right. You know, but I mean, but I mean, I, but I, I talked with Joe Yosinski. He has like replies to that and so on. I, I, mm-hmm. I just say, I, I suspect that if they were to do a follow up for the last um, decade and um, they're not, <laughs> I've asked. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, it, it actually very resource intensive to do this kind of work. I would um, think. You know, um, but. I suspect that we would see a, a spike around the Trump era. Sure. Um, it's not necessarily the case. I mean, the polls that the the same folks have done um, show um, do not show like massive surges. I mean, you see certain conspiracy theories getting more popular, others getting less popular, but it's actually not as much as a surge as you might guess from some coverage. But I suspect you would have, you know, a spike in the Trump era. But I think that's also just kind of specific to the times in the same way the Watergate spike or the McCarthy era spike were. I don't think that there's a sort of general increase in paranoia the way people do when they talk 
mean when they talk about social media, mm -hmm. you know, spreading conspiracy theories more. Um, it's, um, I think the internet has sped up the process, but it hasn't made people more fearful or more prone to conspiracy theories in general. Um, so he also asked about a favorite. I don't know. I like the, um, I like the, I talk about the ironic style in there. That's one of my, um, another one of my topics in the book, the oh, yeah, Gordians, yeah. the church of the sub the people who sort of create these um, conspiracy mythologies that are not, um, uh, they're, they're not out to either espouse conspiracy theories or debunk them. Although mm -hmm. many of them end up doing one or the other because <laughs> um, it's easier to fall down a rabbit hole and it's also easier to start backlashing. But the bit larger uh, point is to sort of just may have fun with this um, big mutant mythos in a way you can sort of um, you know, glean insights about society, uh, engage in satire, have fun. And those are the, uh, to my mind, um, uh, I mean, my those are those are certainly my favorite people to write about in the book, yeah. um, and the um, the folks who I felt sort of most spiritually akin to as I was writing the book. Um, something I'm reminded of the uh, birds aren't real thing. Yeah, uh, that's sort of, that's like things a modern, like that a little bit. Yeah, it's a, a modern version of that a little watered down. They're a little bit um, earnest in a way about it <laughs> that um, you know is not necessary. I mean, it's kind of like. Um, let me put it this way: there, there, there are somewhat more earnest and less subtle version of the same thing. Um, I enjoy the yeah. birds aren't real thing, but I also think you know the joke got sort of exhausted faster, let's say, than some of the uh, earlier versions of this. Yeah, um, there's. I actually found I had not seen this when I was uh, writing the book, but there was like a tract from. Oh, it was some point in the 19th century. I have a copy of it. I should find the year. But it was um, it was arguing that Napoleon wasn't real. Oh, and no. It was, it, was, it was a joke. It was supposed yeah. to be, it was a parody of, um, it was like written by sort of a conservative Christian French person um, ar who didn't like the way that people were sort of seeing the Bible as metaphor. And so to sort of make his point, he would try to prove that Napoleon was just a metaphor. Oh, um, it, it's actually, it's, it's that pretty actually funny. is good. Yeah. yeah. I like yeah, that. I see the so this is actually kind of a long, people have been doing things like this and not always from a more progressive or libertarian direction also. Sure. But um, yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, so I, so from Napoleon isn't real to birds, isn't real to, you know, whatever the version a hundred years from now will be. Uh, my uh, blind friend doesn't really enjoy that the teens, probably on TikTok, that's where the teens are now, had a whole thing about Helen Keller not being real. And, oh, yeah, there's like, there's a the mm -hmm. Helen Keller hoax, right? That's Which uh, she is a little offended by for kind of obvious reasons, because the implication is like, my goodness, that's too impressive for an olden days disabled person. It must be an elaborate hoax. Yeah, I um, um, I think I told you about, but um, the the my Stevie Wonder story, right? Yes. Yeah, for the benefit of your readers, I mean listeners. Well, <laughs> maybe maybe there's a maybe there's a transcript too. Um, there is, you know, there is this whole set of theories that you know Stevie Wonder isn't really blind. Um, and if you want to go looking for evidence, you know, the guy has a fantastic ear. Of course, you can find him, you know, doing <laughs> things there. But I was once um, sitting in, I will call it a green room, although it was actually just like the, you know, the front office of this radio station. It wasn't green, um, waiting for an interview. And I was sitting next to talk about my book. And I was sitting next to this um, nice, you know, nice woman uh, who had been one of Stevie Wonder's backup singers. And she was promote, there to promote her Christmas album. You know, this is a very Baltimore story. Um, mm -hmm. And we get to talking, you know, and it turns out like her brother's into conspiracy theories. Like she gives me her album. I give her the book to give to him and so on. Um, and we start talking about like the uh, the Stevie Wonder isn't blind conspiracy theories. Because yeah. of course she's heard all of them. And she said that um, one of the sort of initiation um, pranks that, you know, when people sort of join the, um, the traveling show would be for Stevie Wonder to take you for a quote unquote drive. Huh. And they sort of set up, and they, they sort of set up the car and it's like, you know, he moves forward. He knows exactly how far to go and so forth. It's something they've mm -hmm. done before, but it sounds like he kind of likes to lean into. Uh, Why like, not? Whole idea. Sure. Yeah. So. I'm pretty sure I've seen footage of Doc Watson, another blind uh, musician driving as well. And I think he probably also 
drove a couple feet, but you know, was there's was an so album blind. cover where Doc Watson is in like the driver's seat of a car okay. with like, with sunglasses. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a. I, it might have been when he like decided to do a rockabilly album. It was like some sort of like off, not his usual thing. But yeah. I should probably listen to that. I feel I, I feel like I've seen, you know, like footage of, like like it actually happened, but it was, you know. No, that it may have happened too. I don't Yeah, know. I don't know. But yeah, this is the this is a running thing that does annoy the uh disabled people sometimes. I, I or imagine. unless you're Stevie Wonder and then you lean into it. That also makes sense. <laughs> How has the paranoid like you being what do I keep annoying you by calling you the paranoid expert, the the king of paranoia, uh, whatever you are? Um, how has that influenced what your actual political beliefs are and stuff? I mean, has one led to the other at all? Probably like, worked the other way around. Um, I mean, when I was a teenager um, and sort of uh, getting increasingly uh, anti-authoritarian and libertarian in my outlook, I was also... Um, I was more prone to conspiracy theories than I am now. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, uh, I, which is not itself. I mean, it was part, I was sort of getting interested in them for the same reason I was moving towards these politics, but I didn't have quite as much perspective on what um, reason was that? What's that? What reason was that? I mean, I mean the same sort of distrust of authority, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm still, you know, always open to, um, stories and so forth. I just feel that, um, they're, there was some evidence that I found convincing then that I sure. read much more on the subject now. And I'm like, all right, you know, you know, do not believe the first Kennedy assassination book you read, you know, <laughs> Probably my, not, yeah. memo to my 14 year old self. There are other <laughs> books on this subject. Um, even then actually, cause the first one I read their big piece of evidence, even at the time I recognized as being kind of not all that convincing, which was the uh, coup d'etat in America by uh, Michael Canfield and A.J. Weberman, uh, Weberman being most famous for going through Bob Dylan's garbage. Um, <laughs> to what and, end? Yeah, and there, there's actually, well, I, we can go on about him uh, <laughs> separately. Um, he, uh, there's a, um, but their big thing was there are these photos of tramps um, at Dealey Plaza the day Kennedy uh, was killed. And right. they were saying these look like um, E. Howard Hunt and Frank Sturgis of the Watergate <laughs> scandal. And, you know, I mean, it's like you look at the photos that they had next to the other photos of them. And all you can say is, I can't say it's not them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not like you have two black women or something. Right. <laughs> but it's uh, that's really blurry. And I, I'm, I'm not convinced by this. But, you know, I, I um, went on to but it was still intrigued me. And I read The Yankee and Cowboy War by Carl Oglesby, who I like for various reasons, but who I think goes beyond what the evidence I now would say goes beyond what, you know, the evidence um, suggests, but because I liked his whole Yankee and cowboy model of how power worked, I was mm. willing to overlook a, a number of things. Um, so I don't know. I, I think that, you know, my politics are on the one hand, I'm, I might be more than other people willing to entertain um, stories in which, you know, our leaders are, are crooks. Um, although that's, well, a, very definitely American, crooks. that's a very American <laughs> idea. Um, but I'm, I'm certainly, uh, you know, or, or, or maybe something stronger in crooks or, you know, immoral shitbags, you know, whatever you want to say, but at They're the crooks, same time, but are they competent crooks is yeah. always my question. Yeah. So, because I, I also am like, uh, prone to, you know, thinking that plans aren't going to work, um, that, uh, you know, things are going to fall apart. Um, I, I, I'm much more kind of open to, uh. I mean, I mean, a lot of um, some of us here, libertarians, you know, setting out these big sketches of the grand plan. And then I say, I thought we agreed central planning doesn't work. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there is there is yeah. a there's a conflict at the heart of, of, of any paranoid libertarian type. Um, yeah. So, if you really believe, you know, but if the you believe it, masters, I mean, like, there's a difference between believing in one big conspiracy that controls everything and believing in lots of little conspiracies, half of which, you know, don't work out. And sure. Much of which are just along the lines of, you know, bribing a congressman or, or, or um, um, you know, sabotaging uh, an election in the third world or, 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 or something like that. All and of that happened. Yeah. Like I mean, that, I mean, that, that happened. definitely so, happened. Yeah. So I, I have, uh, and also because I am, um, because a big part of my 
arguments here are, it has to do with the ways that people empower themselves, embrace conspiracy theories, and how mm-hmm. these ideas will often permeate society without being recognized as conspiracy theories because that word is that phrase is used as a pejorative. Um, right. And so, you know, the satanic panic was not perceived as a conspiracy theory by most people in the 1980s. It was, of course, it was. Totally. As, yeah. And this is true of moral panics again and again. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that kind of, I have that kind of debunking attitude towards, you know, the moral panics and conspiracy theories of the powerful. Um, and that is, you know, also part of my politics or informs my politics or is informed by my politics. Whichever it is. <laughs> yeah, I still dabble in little JFK, a little Bin Laden raid conspiracies. But I usually only go, I'm not confident. I go as far as, I bet something weird happened we don't know about. I mean, but my, I mean... Two, my two <laughs> go-to examples, because people always ask me, well, which ones do you believe in? Mm. And I'm in general, as, as you know, as someone who's like known me forever, I, I'm very wary about believing in anything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just like levels of probability, you know, but it, it's, it's, it's kind of like, zen you know, of you, maybe. Like there's, so I, um, but like the two that I always thought had the most, um, the most, um, that was most, had, I entertained the most suspicious uh, suspicions about one of them was, you know, about the Malcolm X assassination and the, you know, the government of New York recently said, yeah, we kind of got yeah. that completely wrong. I don't know if I can even call that a conspiracy theory now. I mean, there's still open questions about, well, were there policemen who had advanced knowledge and so on? But they basically said some of the people who were locked up for this um, were not, um, you know, were not guilty. And of course, that was something where no matter what happened, we knew there was a conspiracy because there was multiple gun- gunmen, you know, so it's very easy to then technicalities put, again. Yeah. So it's very easy then to um, to sort of e- extrapolate further, you know, and when you've got, you know, there are multiple people and you know, they're unanswered questions, pretty much anything's going to be a conspiracy theory. But yeah. And then the other one, which, you know, has not had that happen yet, but is it, but it's another one where we knew there was a conspiracy, the Oklahoma city bombing. Cause Ooh, there was, I yeah. forgot that one yeah. did get me because there was at least one accomplice, but you know, there, there are reasonable arguments that there were more accomplices that, you know, they did not have the goods on. Um, there is a book that, that sold me on that. And I'm blanking on the title. Um, was it, it was by those British reporters. Um, it's two guys. Yeah. Um, so maybe that is it. Um, yeah. It, it, it is one of, it's, it's what I always crave, which is the like very sober, very kind of careful thing that makes you paranoid and believe something happened yeah. that you don't know about, because it really just is like, but we don't know. And that's weird. And that's a, and just the whole, I don't know, federal agencies having their weird ego war, um, and that getting in the way of investigating and that German guy, John Ronson, my other, uh, one, another highlight of conspiracy writers seems to kind of subscribe to that too, based on his, um, secret rulers of the world documentary. So like some people I trust pretty well, um, seem to think there's something there. So I, I would certainly say the case is not closed on it. You know, yeah. I'm not someone who has a, um, like a, a, a firm commitment here. And I, and for that matter, it's been, years since I was even reading this stuff, mm. you know, and I don't know what, there may even be more stuff that's come out, but I just think that there was a lot more um, support for this than there was for, you know, like suspicions about Dorothy Hunt's plane crash or, you know, some of the, uh, or, you know, the uh, assassination of Robert Kennedy or, or some of the other things that people have um, suspicions about. So. Does um does RFK Jr. not think Sirhan Sirhan did it? Is that is that why he thinks I, I, I we think should let him out? He's he's as we know very conspiracy theory <laughs> prone. Um, Indeed, I um and I think he might be. I there's like there's like some division among RFK's um kids about that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't and I I would I'm pretty confident he was on the conspiracy side, but I. I is that my memory or is that just me having my emotions <laughs> about RFK Jr.? Uh, you don't it's trust it's been too long since I was looking at that stuff. I don't remember. See, I'm yeah. not the expert after all. Well, you just got a lot of conspiracies jammed in that, uh, yeah. in that brain. So, uh, but no, yeah. Oklahoma city bombing. Uh, I, I, the investigative roads not taken and like never just count federal agencies warring with each other over closing a case and being the guys that closed it. Yeah, stuff even 
the government manages to do stuff. Yeah. Well, um, it's very clear in that case that McVeigh was part of this radical right underground and was traveling among these people at Elohim City and so on. And there's this very mm-hmm. bizarre milieu that's interesting in reading about, even if none of those people were involved in it. And it's also true that that milieu was heavily infiltrated, um, which doesn't mean the government was behind it because right. we are talking about incompetent right. people. Um, yeah. But that's also um, very interesting Interesting to look at the uh, the PATCON, um, you know, surveillance and so on. So, you know, it's worth... Um, it, it's worth exploring if, if you're into that kind of thing and, and, and enjoy, um, you know, following uh, stories with lots of open questions. Yeah. I mean, once again, I ask myself, why is this still fun in our depressing medical conspiracy, again, Trumpy era? And I'm still like having a good time thinking about like, you know, just terrible crimes and who was involved in them. But somehow it's fun. You, um, I believe you signed your copy of your book to me to a paranoid extremist, but in a good way. And I do try to live my life following those tenets. Well, thank you. This day. I, I, I've given you your mission. And your, and your <laughs> you confirmed, you reaffirmed it. Yeah. You strengthened it, I would say. Um, Nathan, who was not being, who was being pretty Nathan vague. is our only listener. Hi, Nathan. Well, Corey, Corey Massimino also wanted to, to, to pastor you. Hi, but Corey. Don't... Yeah, boy, it's like all this C4SS people. This is a... Um... <laughs> well, you three uh, have not broken my, my anarchist libertarian heart yet in terms of going off the rails. Um, and that group gets smaller every day, I think. So I will... Just don't disappoint me, that's all. Um. Yeah, no, Nathan was literally like, what kind of anarchist movements you like, which is not well phrased, Nathan. Um, though we love you. What kind of anarchist movements do I like? I'm not sure what he means by that. I know. Damn it, Nathan. The nice um, ones? Um, well, you were just tweeting the ones about... That don't beat people up. Mm-hmm. You know, don't, don't, um, don't beat up random strangers. Um and, and you know, are working on um, building a, a new society within the seeds of the old. That's good. Building a new society within the seeds of the old. I, in general, if you find yourself um, joining the government of the Spanish Republic and setting up internment camps, you have taken <laughs> the wrong turn. That's Great. Just, uh, yeah. That no. that was a wrong turn. Also, um, uh, Richard Nixon took a wrong turn. That a was, couple. Yeah, well, it's he went through a Tolstoyan period in his in his youth. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't think he called himself an anarchist, but he was interested in the Tolstoyan anarcho pacifist. Um, That's idea. chilling. Yeah. So, well, you know, who also went through a brief period of, in his case, I think it was Bakuninist, but definitely leftist anarchism in his youth was Mao. So I uh, I like to imagine that the I might Mao, have heard. The I might Mao, have heard a little about that. Yeah, the Mao Nixon summit. You know, there being a moment when they say, "Ha ha ha!" Well, those we're it's about time we establish world <laughs> anarchy, wouldn't you say? Now nah, let's, let's keep doing what we're doing and kill lots of people. Um, yeah, so those would be yeah. Any sort of Nixonian or Maoist anarchy is is definitely not what I support. It's also not. I mean, anarchy. it's not actually as a, anarchy. As a former uh, user of the term ANCAP, who abandoned it 80% due to the existence of Christopher Cantwell, I will say that Maoist anarchism is definitely not real. Um, the, so. There is a this great term, anarcho Mao spontex. Um, no, but there's like this Paul Berman, um, who's a former anarchist, who is now like sort of a social democrat, uh, humanitarian wars type guy. But he had this, um, he's written stuff about like 60s history. And he had this Mm -hmm. kind of good um, bit where he said, you can divide the new left into three categories, the old school Marxists, the neo-Marxists, and the inconsistent libertarians. (laughs) (laughs) And there there was, and he talked about this sort of, these people whose like sort of um, idea of what they wanted in their, own society was very anarchist or at least anarchistic, but Mm -hmm. who had these sort of weirdly idealized versions of what was going on in Cuba, Vietnam, China, 
um, that totally did not match the you know totalitarian regimes, but were but were uh, had this idea that oh yeah, out there it's all decentralized, and, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's to me that's just how I look at leftists when I'm feeling pejorative about the term something yeah. like Cuba, where I mean, sure, Batista sucked. Uh, some of the points of contention were totally solid, uh, old Fidel, but then things went, as far as I'm concerned, authoritarian and violent quite quickly, if not immediately. Yeah. So, yeah. like, that's just... But but there was this whole, especially with, um, in the 1970s towards China, people who had this idea of, um, of Maoism as being um, this sort of decentralized, anarchistic um, system. Jesus Christ! <laughs> Yeah, it, which um, and some people, um, you, know, you had some folks like Foucault at least working with Maoists, but beyond that, um, in the libertarian movement, Leonard Ligio got a bit into this. Carl Hess flirted with it. Um, <laughs> Carl Hess flirted with a lot, but yeah, somehow it's no, not as offensive true. as Rothbard. That the, he has uh, he had quite a journey. Stephen Halbrook <laughs> got very into the uh, the Mao thing. Uh, but also not just um, you had John Cage, you know, who you know the um, avant garde composer. Who's like the big right. big influence on his politics was James J. Martin's Men Against the State, like the, the book on like Benjamin Tucker and Lysander Spooner. God, and I didn't them. know that. But he that's had this fun, little but he that's had, a fun fact. But he had this little phase of like, oh yeah, Mao. You know, <laughs> did you hear what they're doing in China? <laughs> you see, Is there something about <laughs> like struggle sessions and other shit is like it's decentralized it was just another idealized orient for people you know i mean it would pop up in like the whole earth catalog you know um which a very um and, and and i should say the whole earth catalog of course it never had like a single party line i mean it had a very mm -hmm. kind of libertarian ish kind of spirit to it but and um but there was uh, people from a variety of um political flavors to it but you know, there's a little bit of a little bit of Maoism cropping up there. Um, I think Stuart Brand, maybe it was not him. I, I don't want to um, smear Stuart Brand by definitively saying it was him who wrote this. But there was like this little mini review they did of The Dispossessed, the great anarchist Ursula Le Guin novel. And they said that this and the guy who's um, who I think was Stuart Brand, who wrote the little squib about it, said that this uh, book changed his thinking and got him more interested in folks like Kropotkin and Mao. So what, like, you know, I, this is actually something that would be like a fun article. I, I don't know if that there's more than like two dozen people would be interested in it. So maybe I shouldn't spend my time on it. But like, and they're weird, all listening right now. Yeah, weird idealized visions of Maoist China in the 1970s. Part of it, I should also say there's a, um, oh, David Dellinger, um, the member of the Chicago eight, the sort of hardcore pastor, oh, okay. mm -hmm. um, but who was very um, prone to idealizing, these third world countries. Um, mm -hmm. a, uh, but he wrote a, P, a dispatch from the cultural revolution, like the original early one, um, mm -hmm. which I think he actually even used the word libertarian in reference to the red guards. Um, Lord. It, it was like really, in, they were, they really took at face value, this idea of um, he is, tr Mao is trying to overthrow the communist um, ossified bureaucracy I mean, taking this sort of initial rhetoric of the Cultural Revolution at face value, and that this was like trying to, um, um, you know, th 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 this is an anti-authoritarian revolt, and that this is very different. It was very different from Stalinism, you know. <laughs> Although Stalinists often <laughs> the end result now. was surprisingly and, similar. And so there, and I wrote an article in Reason last year um, for our um, communism issue, um, which, among other things, talked about. A, um, a group that was a uh, Shenwilian. Um, there was a self-described ultra left of the cultural revolution, um, which was arguing for not just overthrowing Mao's enemies in the communist party, but overthrowing the party itself and moving towards a Paris commune style, um, uh, decentralized democracy. And the, um, their big manifesto was called wither China. It's very interesting reading mm -hmm. um, because although there are some, tedious parts where they sort of strain to show that this is what Mao um, really wanted. You know, you got to refer to the text and point to that. Um, the larger argument was this sort of radical critique of the party state. And well, 
they uh, turns out this was not what Mao really wanted. And, you know, <laughs> they, they cracked down. And um, the author of that manifesto, who was a teenager when he wrote it, um, spent a decade in a series of prison camps. Um, and like in the quickly learned that actually he did not like Mao. Like he wrote a pet prison memoir and he's like in the first year. I don't remember if it was in his book, that book or in one of the interviews um, where he said like in the first real year, he realized no, Mao was actually just locking up his critics. Um, but then um, his manifesto kept circulating, um, you know, in the democracy movement in the 70s and 80s, people who did not have nostalgia for Mao, you know, would, would still read and, and point to this essay. And when he came out, he started studying um, economics and became this big um, free market guy who James Buchanan uh, embraced, like uh, embraced his work. He, uh, you know, wrote favorably about Adam Smith and Milton Friedman and so on. Um, but the um, you can still see if you read Wither China and you read the stuff he was writing at the end of his life uh, I mean, two decades ago, where he's saying that. Um, in order for China to have economic reform, we also need civil liberties and, and self-government. Um, there's a real sort of um, continuity from the left communist critique to the free market libertarian critique. There's a uh, the idea, because uh, in the left communist, he's still talking about you got to just sort of remove the ministries and let people run things themselves. He sure. just has this sort of airy kind of you know self-management kind of idea of, of how that's going to happen. And he's um, <coughs> in his uh, last work. He's he's you know still critiquing in a much more sophisticated way the party state in ways that you can see the roots of in this stuff from the sixties. So it's a um, it's certainly true that someone working from that original Maoist toolkit could end up in a very libertarian space. But I take that person's mm. journey as very different than the starry-eyed Westerners looking at China and imagining something good is going on. Sure. Um, the, the other thing I will say, I'm sorry, you've got me going off on the No, I mean, I'm learning, so point. that's why I'm <laughs> There is I'm a very strong argument to be made that although Mao's um, rationale for the Cultural Revolution was bullshit, he was obviously not interested in overthrowing the power structure he was just trying to purge, <laughs> you know, and although the Cultural Revolution itself led to terrible crimes, lots of people dying is not a good thing, it did so decimate um, Chinese society. Um, I mean, I, I should say Chinese society it did that too. So decimate the um, structures of power in China, just the chaos of it, that the beginnings of the market reform in China were ultimately began by people out in the countryside um, in the wake of all this change in the late cultural revolution, um, just starting on their own to tend pi private plots and ignore official orders and do the, um, do the kind of spontaneous market revolution that Deng Xiaoping later began to formally ratify, but which did not begin um, with what we think of as the market reforms of the eighties. You know, that was building on what people were already starting to do spontaneously of, of, on their own. And the cultural revolution did inadvertently pave the way for that. Again, that is not what people were <laughs> like Dave Dellinger and uh, Stephen Holbrook were meaning when they wrote that, that. But it is like sort of like one of the great sort of paradoxical, um, one might almost say dialectical. <laughs> I would never <laughs> say dialectical. Moments uh, in, in uh, recent history. So I don't think Nathan Goodman's question was really about um, the Cultural Revolution. Corey, <laughs> Corey, with again broad strokes, um, wanted to know about the biggest misconception about the libertarian movement that people have, and what is your favorite rarely known libertarian movement fact? So, I might have already sprinkled in a couple of rarely yeah, known libertarian movement facts. It goes that way. Facts. I'll have to. Um, um, yeah, I, I can try to think of another one now. I do. I have, mean. I do have I the weird assortment of them. Here, here's another. Um, here's another Carl Hess one. Um, okay, good. Uh, already. In 1972, Carl Hess was the um, when Benjamin Spock ran on a third party New Left ticket, the People's Party, for president. Um, mm. This was 72. Was the first year there was a Libertarian Party candidate. He was only on the ballot and in two states. Um, Carl Hess was the shadow secretary of education in, for Benjamin Spock. And the People's Party um, 
platform, which which also, I mean, Spock called for things like having a maximum wage and so on, but it also <laughs> called for vouchers and the end of compulsory education. Um, and there that was, was very a, in vogue in the seventies. Yeah, more than it, it, it was. Been. And and Hess also tried to uh, reach out for a meeting uh, with George Wallace, who was oh, wild, who was doing his uh, <laughs> populist um, right wing populist. Um, campaign up until he was shot, actually continued after he was shot for a bit uh, in the Democratic primaries. But he uh, it included some critique of corporate power. And, and Hess was trying to see about getting some Wallaceites into the his libertarian new left um, Spock coalition. Um, so, yeah, that's that's a, a weird nexus of, uh, of of libertarian trivia right there. That is I love those. Weird. You got some weird cross sections in your book. The um, black people using Confederate flag imagery and some wild. wild Is that stuff. in the book? I wrote about that. Did I have that in the in in articles? I swear you did. Maybe not. I, I, I I've, I've done a couple of articles that talk about that. I don't think mm-hmm. it was in the book, but I I don't know. I wrote that book ten years ago. But it seems like you would know better than I, but it's certainly something I learned from your writings, at least, um, that there are some very interesting Venn diagram middle things, some of which are better than, well, whenever we were trying in the 90s. That was a horrible mistake. Um, Okay, so the traditional question on the non-serving podcast before my time uh, has to be asked, which is, how would you buy a cappuccino? in your political utopia. Um, apparently cappuccino, that part's important, not just the coffee. So I have to clarify that. First of all, you're assuming I would buy it. Well, I mean, if we're true. talking utopias, um, you know, I mean, maybe I have like a, 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 a coffee printer where I can just press a button and, and it appears. You don't know that. Um, but obviously, no, there would be a federal department of coffee with a dedicated, um, <laughs> office that's completely dedicated to creating the cappuccinos i like um Mm. and other and other coffees you know because i don't really want a cappuccino (laughs) um and it would be uh funded by a a, a tax on you know people who criticize my writing (laughs) i don't believe that i think i've just been kicked out of the non-servium podcast Yeah. yeah shunned for all time so really you're gonna give me that answer the, the answer that is lies is that what we're do i have to come up with a real answer i mean the real answer yes. is i get it from whoever is willing to provide it um through whatever means you know we work out you know i buy it or maybe there's a maybe i go into a workplace where there's always cappuccino there because someone makes it or maybe i have a cappuccino maker not likely because i um I, you know, that's not the kind of coffee I generally drink. Um, <laughs> you just, you've destroyed the question just by virtue of not wanting a cappuccino. This yeah, is the, yeah. This is the that's problem. The, uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm. All, we're both not ones. We're not quite the anarchist types to like redesign entire economies, you know, for fun. Um, but I mean, I, I, I like the good old star trek uh end of scarcity laziness as you said the print just print that coffee you know i i should (laughs) i should say if we were going to do the kind of anarchist that wants to redesign economies for fun i'll just take my old answer about the federal department of coffee and and sand off that sign and put up one that says the united coffee cooperative um (laughs) That's and, and, like and I'll have really an elaborate daring. answer about how you know this spokes council uh, elects <laughs> the um, the uh, Paracon princess or whatever for the. <laughs> yeah. So you're just swinging wildly between horrible extremes. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Well, I don't really. I don't. All right. All right. <laughs> that's that's all we're gonna get with the coffee. Um, mostly dumbest stuff besides like. The only thing I have left sort of is apropos of nothing except your Twitter questions about the fun things you were tweeting about. But um, I guess the people also wanted to know if Elon Musk is going to break Twitter and if you care at all. (laughs) I don't think he's going to break Twitter. I mean, it's not absolutely. There's still ways the deal cannot happen, um, although they've accepted it, you know. Mm -hmm. And by the time this 
um, actually comes out. Who knows what the state of play will be? But um, I think that people who are sort of imagining um, Elon Musk as a savior are wrong. But the people who are seeing this as the apocalypse are are insane. I mean, he has some ideas I don't like. He, I mean, he has the idea. Uh, I mean, well, I generally like the idea of a more free speech Twitter. I he's also talking about ending an anonymous speech, which is actually that's an crazy. Anti, yeah, that's an anti free speech um, move. And maybe I'm misreading his remark, but I hope he can. Um, I hope he can rein that in. Um, um, but in general, if um, you know, if Twitter is you know less free and inconsistent with the ban hammer that will make it a better place. Um, I, it would be nice if he would move towards the whole, you know, a, a protocol, not a platform. Nobody owns Twitter really. Cause you know, there's just companies using this system kind of, um, idealistic, um, you know, vision of an open source interoperable tomorrow. I'm not counting on him to do that. Um, but the idea that things are bound to get worse under him, I, I think, is just people who who specifically don't like him as a cultural figure projecting a lot onto that. Um, that said, I, I really don't like the stuff he said about anonymity. And I, and I think if there's a, a way things could go wrong, um, that's I mean, that's the most likely way things could go wrong. Obviously, there are all kinds of ways things can go wrong. Yeah, the thing about anonymity um <laughs> I don't think it's been clarified, obviously, yet, but talking about vera, is it verification of humans? Some weird yeah, phrase it, where it, yeah. that's what you have to do with like the blue check mark shit. <coughs> but then that would be no different than now. If he's really, if he, as much as I, I'm only, I'm mixed at best on him, I didn't, he didn't strike me as somebody who was, who was dying to, you know, kill anonymous. Tweeting. Yeah, I mean, um, again, I hope that this is just exaggerated and reading too much into that remark about, you know, I, I, he's had a couple of remarks, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, but I it's, mean, that's one it's, of the it's, only it's things out because most of of what he um, has said is suggested he wants a more of a loose touch, a, a light touch on, um, and and that's as it as it should be because ultimately the the best way to you know govern you know who can talk to us and what we see you know, is to give us that power give us those tools um which we have to a great degree and we could have more of it you know um so i uh but you know who knows i guess i guess yeah. we'll see it, it is weird did you see that aclu statement uh i did and they were being weird like they are of late they, they um, said like they don't want this much power concentrated in any government or any one individual and i say but in a corporate board is better, you know, I mean, I mean it, Twitter is still Twitter, yeah. you know, I mean, it, it, to the extent that there is power concentrated there, it's, it's concentrated there, whether he owns it or not. Um, and that seems, um, it seems odd to, you know, say it's uh, of greater concern with him than it is with, you know, the current ownership. Um I mean, people are. I think pe most people wildly overstate the importance of Twitter. Speaking as someone who tweets way too much to the detriment of actually oh, sure. writing substantial things. Um, and I, I, I go on. Yeah, sorry. But it's part of it's because the president used to be on it and was a huge pain in the ass. And part of it maybe is that certain hashtags that started there sort of migrated into the real world, but. Even that, a very small percentage of people, and a lot of those people are either sort of back padding, blue check mark liberal type, and journalists, um, and sort of the conservative contingent of people who are way too excited about Musk's purchase because now, you know, the horrible tyranny of Twitter being so liberal will be over. I guess Twitter I mean, is is its importance is exaggerated because um, it's where the journalists hang out. Absolutely. You know, I mean, it's so and I'm clear. one of them, you know, I mean, it's kind of, I, 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 I kept meaning to make a little photo of my family. Like, so where they have a little arrow pointing to me saying Twitter and to my wife saying Facebook and to our older daughter saying Instagram and to our younger daughter saying Roblox, because, you know, we're all in these, I mean, you know, I'm on Facebook too. Rona's on Twitter too, you know, yeah. and, and I think actually, um, you know, Maya probably spends more time on different discord servers, my older daughter than, than mm -hmm. she does on, Instagram that she's there too, but it's really, um, 
you know, Facebook is far more significant in terms of both everyday people's lives and in terms of politics than Twitter is. But Twitter is where the reporters hang out. This is another reason why um, the kind of talking about concentrated power. Um, if you're going to worry about concentrated power, Twitter is kind of the last of the big platforms to think about. I mean, it really is this kind of weird outlier in a lot of ways. Um, and it's, um, I, I, you know, there are a lot of it is also the Musk thing is people not wanting Trump to come back on it. Um, Which I sympathize because I found him just grating well, I, I, all I, political things. I will say that Twitter is, I mean, a lot more pleasant to be on. Pleasant isn't the right word. <laughs> it's a lot less unpleasant to be on with him not being there because he was such the center of gravity. Anything he did, half my feed would be people um, responding to it, making oh the God, same yeah. jokes or the same critiques it just got so tedious well the same jokes is also a twitter classic yeah so. but when it's all the same jokes about donald trump it just got very <laughs> people ha i mean when it's just people doing the stupid drump thing for the two trillion oh my time, god i don't understand that joke and i still yeah so it's it was, just a slightly different name it's and, not as and any really sillier is, than trump it's the same thing and i know people on the right they say well don't you like how trump just makes the liberals crazy you say no i get sick of watching that <laughs> Oh my God. I, I get sick of watching that as much as I get. So it was very, um, it, and I would periodically, if you're listening to this and you wonder, and, and I used to follow you on Twitter and I stopped, the most likely reason is because I would periodically go through Trump purges. Like I just mm. say, I just like going through who was tweeting a lot about Trump, who I don't absolutely need to see for now the other stuff they tweet about sorry you're my friend but i gotta i just gotta get some of this off my off my page um or else you know the other things i use twitter for became useless so yeah i gotta say i, I don't miss having him there um but it's also twitter was not the center of his i mean his i mean facebook was much more important for trump's influence than than um than twitter was you know it's just the personal touch of him tweeting insanely at all hours, I guess. Yeah, was, I mean, it was a special time. It, it was certainly there was. I don't remember who had the line about a, uh, a science fiction story where the president is crazy, and we know because we all have magic little boxes in our um, in our pockets that light up whenever he says something crazy in private. Yes. I and mean, that was kind of what we were living through <laughs> for uh, four I, years I, there. I mean that that just is it that that. That's yeah. What it was. So, but this is also when people, talk, there were some people like Glenn Greenwald was one who were saying, like, you know, banning Trump was like, this is how far it's gone. Oh, dear God. Never. Do you know how perfect the world would have to be for me to give a shit that the president can't tweet? It's very, or the ex president. I am generally a let everyone tweet person. And I, mm -hmm. if you brought back, um, you know, I mean, if you're not engaged in fraud or organized harassment, fine, you know. But the state is those, Jesse. You know the state is those. Yeah, so I yeah. So <laughs> but I think the least free speechy thing is you know, the least free speechy situation is one where the big um Boy, that was the wrong phrase. Absolutely, what I'm trying to get is <laughs> the situation that makes me the, the least concerned about like the future of free speech on the platform or something is one where the conflict is a platform refusing to run the statements of the head of state. Right, the man that is one where clearly the free speech all. interest is is uh, much stronger on you know the platform who's refusing its side. And I am much less concerned. I mean, quite apart from the fact that it was just sort of tedious watching Trump and people mm -hmm. responding to him after a few years, I was much less concerned about his ability to tweet than I was about, you know, random people who ran afoul of an algorithm without intending to because, you know, this statue looked like pornography to it. Or actually, that was on <laughs> Facebook. That wasn't on Twitter. But you know what I mean. It, it was That kind of thing was much more concerning to me than the fact that the fucking president, you know, couldn't... Um, um, beam typos at us at three in the morning <laughs> i mean um, that's that's the weird thing about the green and sort of scare quote at this point anti-authoritarians where the spirit of the thing is often on point but the idea that i should be as concerned about trump's freedom of expression or even freedom from government surveillance than i am about yours or 325 million other people is absurd 
Like the president should have less free speech, <laughs> less privacy, and you know, ide- ideally fewer nuclear footballs. But uh, well, that's just me. Yeah, that would be the more important one: is the uh, the, the fewer nuclear footballs. Um, it's true. Yeah. But uh, I, I have. I like the way that we put that in a plural. Like he's got. Like, <laughs> I don't want- Maybe there might be a back. There probably is a backup. Who but, knows? You know, no. I mean, I think the the surveillance concerns were legitimate in in that case. But they I, are, and yet I but, hate it. But it was, but it was, it was aggravating to me that we were so unable to get people to move past that towards actual reform of the surveillance state. You know that that there was the people who were just concerned about it in the Trump context. They were not only were they not able to make that leap, but um, it was so it was so difficult to, you know, pull them. I mean, some people, some people did. I mean, not really elected people, but you know, I, I know some people were kind of radicalized by that, and that's that's fine. But it, I mean, it made them realize that actually there were some, you know, maybe there were some problems. I have not. It's been a long time since I've gotten a, a uh, an email from someone on the right saying, "Can you give me any specific cases where the Patriot Act was used to violate someone's <laughs> civil liberties?" This was like a big thing in two thousand three or so. You know, you're complaining about the Patriot Act. But can you uh, can you mention anything actually specific? And it was like it was usually in this kind of. Um, this kind of abusive tone, but I still remember the time where the person like actually went through time saying, I am doing a research project and I just want to know. And it was very polite, but then it, the rest is almost word for word, you know, what they'd seen on the blog and other people yeah. emailed, you know, but so I'm, I guess that's a small blessing. I don't have to, you know, I guess I have to deal with worse things now probably, but <laughs> I mean, that is the optimistic spin. I, some guest, I think it might've been another green wall thing. I don't know. I'm oversighting him. Um, Someone talking about how conservatives sort of what we think of as the rubes and the sticks, some of them genuinely learned because of because precious baby Trump was being surveilled by the surveillance state. They they suddenly learned that there was something bad about the FBI and other places. Yeah. Like that we shouldn't cynical libertarians and anarchists shouldn't be as cynical as to assume that they Some of them didn't genuinely just learn that. And I'm still grappling with that concept because it's actually sort of, I mean, there's plenty of partisan hackery. And if we weren't dealing with the Trump hangover in the Biden era, I feel like there would be more switching back. I don't think things have permanently changed in terms of the right. Unfortunately, you're more likely to see people doing like J.D. Vance and saying we need to debothify the uh, you know, the, you know, the state and get our people in there than they are to talk about. So it's the same thing as ever. Yeah. It know, just, it's, but I do different. think some people, I mean, out there in the vast roiling readership of, of the universe, you know, like did um, take some of the right lessons from, um, from all the but will various they keep security them states that shenanigans. In any substantial fashion. I mean, I don't know. Somehow I don't quite buy it just because the switch the switch, like and looking at Democrats and the way that they switch on, um, say, federal law enforcement, you know, over the decades and over the presidents. It's just. Yeah, I'm just talking about randos here. Yeah, I, randos. I mean, if a rando learns a lesson, yeah. like, isn't that something maybe? <laughs> well, I got to say, there are more randos out there that, that randos are the largest, um, like, you know. Uh, My God, you're right. <laughs> the, the largest uh, um, demographic group in America is the randos. Um, much bigger than pundits and journalists. Absolutely. As so much as- with enough randos, we could change the world. That that's my answer to um Nathan or Corey or whoever was questioned. The anarcho rando <laughs> movement um Beautiful. Is change America. I mean that is optimistic at the end of it. Um okay so again uh, l- l- forget segues and smoothness. You, Jesse Walker, certainly come off as an even tempered kind of fella what are you worried about in politics besides the constant state of authoritarianism and our <laughs> doom and stuff? What am I worried about? Boy, that's, yeah. You know, I mean, in 2019, if you would ask me, what are you worried about? I would not have had the prescience to say a pandemic, you know, I mean, <laughs> these sure. things kind of come out of the blue. And if you had asked me in August, 2001, um, what do you worry about? <laughs> and I would not say 
you know, not the month of September. Center. I'm not yeah. sure that that's that that's going to be um, there. You know, a couple months from now. So <laughs> it's, it's very difficult to predict the crises that can suddenly redirect. Well, not, the- not just that, but I mean, just the 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 you know whatever's going on now in politics. Like I am, you know, creeped out by by what appears to be sort of a not just an exciting backlash against trans people, uh, especially children, but also sort of using that to get in on some like Anita Bryant style, like bullshit. Like, yeah, I mean, that's obviously one of the le- one of the most unpleasant and, and ugly things happening in the country right now is the whole anti-trans um, backlash. Um, and you knew there was going to be some version of this, you know, because yeah. again, we we've watched the gay movement and this is all happening much faster than that did, but that doesn't mean I'm happy to see it happen. Certainly not happy to see, um, um, people trying to then extend it to sort of slip in some anti-gay stuff because the, the general population is basically cool with gay people now. Um, it's, but some ideologues are not and are still going to slip stuff in while people are nervous about trans people. Um, yeah, it's, um, I, you know, I might write something about this. It's, it's kind of, um, it would involve getting into some delicate stuff, um, that I have to figure out how to, um, how to in, engage in a way that it, cause here's the thing. It's like, um, a decade or so ago, if you were kind of just sort of plugged in, you knew, I mean, like sort of like before gay marriage was, you know, finally legalized nationwide, you knew that the trans movement was next in line. You could see mm-hmm. it forming. You know, I, I, I knew it's the last people, one in the LGBT, but it's, yeah, it's you know, I mean, it was kind of like and more people were coming out. I knew, I knew more trans people. It was very, um, they were becoming more visible. The, um, it was a uh, part of the conversation, um, both in left spaces and in libertarian spaces. I mean, mm-hmm. it was people, um, <laughs> a lot of people of, of the sort of, you know, idiot hoppy and variety would probably be kind of surprised at how much of the online, um, op- out trans people that I was sort of interacting with in the late aughts, early teens were, um, libertarians overtly mm-hmm. so, but it was a, um, so, but this was, this completely blindsided the right because the right is, or, or social conservatives, I should say, are always convinced that the next big thing is going to be pedophile liberation. This is the yeah. this is the constant, and I think that after a decade, they've sort of managed to convince themselves that this was actually pedophile liberation in disguise, you know. But it was yeah. so. I, I almost wrote something then. I wanted to say, say, look, you know, as a member of you know the the Illuminati, I can tell you, actually, trans people are next, and in fact, um, the left is more hostile. To, I mean, we've reached a point now where I'm seeing people talking about um, power imbalances in a relationship between someone in their early 20s and so in order than that, you know, take, you know, like these are not about to go Nambla, you know, and that's such a good point, because I've seen that, too, where it's like, all right, leftists, you're well-meaning, but chill out. Yeah, like, so it's a, very a 21 year old can date a 25 year old. It's fine. In the 70s. There was a moment where yeah. that was something that a, a, a lot of people sort of on, on like the, the political avant-garde were interested in. Um, it was, and then there was an enormous backlash, you know, against it in the eighties. And this is like, this is some history that at some point I should probably write up because when I see some people trying to write it, they just get it wrong because they're trying to yeah. find axes. Um, they might only try to associate it with the gay movement when in fact there was, um, Oh God! What's the name of that big men's movement guy? He gave that interview to Penthouse in the seventies, where he's like, you know, praising incest. It was like this super creepy. I mean, like the seventies were gross. Sort of man. like, sort of, but I mean, like incest between like father daughter. It was very seventies um, are gross, man. There, there was a lot of. <laughs> I, I, I had I used to have the theory of the seventies, which was that after the liberation of the sixties, everyone had to get all the bad taste out of their system and that explains fashion and so much more. But at any rate, so there was this and there were also some things that are easy to mistake in retrospect because people if you see people talking about quote unquote age of consent reform in this mm-hmm. in the seventies, sometimes they were coming at that from this kind of pro pedophile direction but other times it's because there were states where the age of consent was literally a, 
older for gay people than for straight people. They had separate ages of consent and they mm-hmm. wanted to end the discrimination. Um, so it was very, um, but at any rate, in the 80s, there was this like a series of like sort of like debates over where, you know, NAMBLA or similar groups had been marching in pride parades and they were driven out. I can remember um, how it must have been around 87, um, 87 or 88. Um, it was shortly after my uh, parents moved to Galveston and in the summers I would be there and. Um, and uh, I would listen to the Houston Pacific station, KPFT, and there was a gay and lesbian show. And I remember them once having a, a, an episode where they were debating, um, you know, should we let these guys be in the pride parade anymore? Mm-hmm. Um, and lots of people calling in and saying no, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, but I always remember the, this one person who called in and I, I've, I've never forgotten this quote. The line was, uh, well, they, they were there for us. We should be there for them. <laughs> I, there's a, there's, there's a lingering. Yeah. Oh my God. But it was very, at any every rate, once in a while was, you see that again. And so it's, I was, I can remember, you know, as you know, an outsider, I'm a straight guy, but you know, who was like, an, you know, a participant in the, in the, the gay rights movement and a supporter of it, you know, encountering these, you know, discussions. Um, and I've looked at historical materials and I know that there was, you know, this was something that was kind of um, going on in the, in the seventies. And then there was this, big retreat from it in the eighties, you know, sort of sure. petering out in the early nineties. Um, and a couple of groups, there was like this Trotskyist group, the revolutionary workers league that would always make asses of themselves in Ann Arbor when I was a student there. And I found out later that they were like in, they're like this tiny, they, they were like participants in, in Amblin and stuff too. It was very oh bizarre to me to, but um, weirdly, um, weirdly enthralling to learn that. So, and, and at any rate, this environment is totally different from the environment um, in the uh, the gay movement and the left and the libertarian movement today. Um, and and yet, people, this whole stupid groomer panic is people sort of convincing themselves that that's what's going on under the surface. You know, you can look back, you can see what it's like when that's going on under the surface, and that's not happening now. Right. And instead, you get people. Um, and you've already got uh, initially there was this thing of like, well, it's you can't have them making um, medical irreversible medical decisions, you know. Which I, I again, I think, you know, I believe in medical autonomy, you know, but um, you know, you should be able to make these, you know, decisions about puberty blockers and so on. But now you're seeing people like condemning like social transitioning, um, just sort of identifying. But make up your mind. You know, I mean... it's and there was. Um, there was this uh, article that Wesley Yang was promoting. He didn't write it. But, you know, this is, it's sort of like you kind of, kind of um, phenomenon of people who kind of enter the counter woke space because they're concerned about free speech and groupthink, And then they start having some of these other things rub off on them and they sort of turn against um, criminal justice reform and trans rights. It's, it's yeah. interesting to watch. Um, but there was, I can't remember the name of the woman who actually wrote it, but it was, she had this whole thing of all these places that had rejected it. Um, and it was, and it, it included the places that rejected it included unheard and tablet. So clearly this was not just like a coalition of the politically correct to keep right, this yeah. out, right? these places yeah. that like really are kind of willing to, who are in that counter woke space. I mm-hmm. to use that term again is our, um, we're not willing to run this, but you know, he, Yang was still promoting it. Um, and it was, um, it was all, all about like how it was just experimenting on, it was like, she was calling it like a psychological intervention without a license to allow these kids to socially transition in school. You know, and it wasn't uh, Abigail Schreier. Was it a new, exciting? It wasn't uh, her. No, it was someone this. who had yeah. like been. And her whole shtick was like she was a. I'm a liberal, but I'm against this. And the end, there was very. You know, I, I can, <laughs> I could tell stories that I won't because they involve privacy of people I know. But there are certainly <laughs> um, liberal parents who are intolerant in this way. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, my daughter has a number of you know trans and non-binary friends. You know, I, I uh, and I and I hear these. Um, you know, stories from, you know, that direction. And it's a, um, you know, this is not people being brainwashed by the schools, you know, this is coming, you know, from them. This is stuff they want to do um, in their teens. Um, And, you know, it's, 
I think in general, it's good for people to let teens try on new identities and experiment and figure out what they want to do. Um, Without and necessarily even, declaring, and, and even, this is your identity forever, so make sure you really, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of like, the pressure well, and this is actually seems. one way that, you know, the some parts of the trans movement have, I think, shot themselves in the foot because they, um, they're, they don't want to talk about groups like detransitioners, and that just leaves it to the anti-trans people to talk about that. I don't think there's any, I don't think it hurts the cause of just of like allowing people this autonomy to figure out who they are and how they want to present themselves to say, Hey, some people are going to experiment with things and decide that's not what's going on. I mean, that's, that's part of what, what happens. And I want to live in a society where people uh, enjoy that flexibility and, and other folks are, are tolerant of it. So, you know, I mean, so, yeah, I I don't, seen... you had asked me what I'm worried about. You got me off on a rant because this is something I'm thinking about writing a about a and I'm trying out the um, trying out parts of the thesis on you. But it's um, it, it's ugly. I, I feel like it's probably ultimately just going to be part of the growing pains, um, and that even some of these measures that are passed will eventually be the dead letter, like you know, some of the anti-gay marriage stuff that passed in 2004. I don't think that right. this is, um, I mean, I think I am kind of, I am a long-term optimist. Um, Me on, too. On that kind I... of issue. But, you know, there are ways it could go wrong. And there certainly are people who can go through a lot of unpleasantness in the meantime while we're waiting for that, for the long term to arrive. Right. Yeah. You know. um, I'll tell you one thing I'm I'm kind of optimistic about um, is that I think that I mean and I the U.S. is more involved in this Ukraine thing than I would like, but right. Biden is has really been resisting the people who want it to be an all-out war, and yeah, and this comes on the heels of for all the ways that the Afghan withdrawal was fucked up. Um, you know, I'm not sure Biden would have started it, and I'm not. I'm, I really don't think Trump would have finished it. Like that combination might have been Me necessary too. to get us out. Yeah, Biden is not an anti-war person, um, no. but I think he might end up being functionally the least interventionist president since Carter. I mean, and I, I, I mean, we could see he could dive deep into something and 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 um, be. Um, uh, and, and do something terrible. And, and, and I, and I'll regret even saying that could happen, but yeah. he has sort of, he has sort of taken the position, a lot of this sort of not really intervention, anti-interventionist, but willing to resist the blob, um, yeah. kind of position that, um, a, a number of libertarians hoped that Trump would be. And, um, and, and because fools, Biden has this of. kind of long history in Washington he was harder to sort of um, just sort of mislead and, and snow. And uh, I mean, not that I think that Trump was a closet dove, but I do have the impression that there were things that he wanted to do that he was stymied from. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, it's true in everything. He was just an incredibly weak president. Um, Thankfully. And mostly. yeah, you know, so it's <laughs> a, but I mean, like something like, you know, I think he was sincere in trying to negotiate in uh, Korea, um, but he was, you know, the John Bolton's, you know, managed to sabotage. Yeah, that, that was and, better and, than. I mean, that was and more legit, more real than a lot of his reputation when yeah, we all you know, forget I mean, that about was all like, the bombs he dropped. Like you know, I mean, I, it's I, I I remember a very unusual position of defending him. I mean, like during that. Yeah, um, me too. During that that uh, whole episode. I mean, the second part, not the first part where he's threatening nuclear war with North Korea. Right. That was the low Tweeting point of his. Of his at him, but yeah. it was kind of. I mean, Biden is actually better at i mean even though like trump he's also kind of you know possibly losing his mind um he <laughs> has managed to um um you know resist um i mean he certainly in the case of afghanistan did not let himself be steamrolled into keeping the troops there it was surprising and and, and in ukraine again there's a lot to criticize about what the u.s has done but there are people pushing for incredibly um, um, risky U.S. behaviors that he's held off, and it's kind of yeah. you know, I um, it's the one part of his presidency which has otherwise been pretty wretched, you know, um, <laughs> that I can say you know this 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 might be the best we can hope for from a president right now. Um, mm -hmm. 
um, for all its problems. Um, having said that now, I, I, he will probably, you know, send off nuclear <laughs> missiles before this actually airs. Before anywhere. this airs, we'll see and how I'll, fast we'll we can regret, edit it. As the last three survivors <laughs> on, the, on the planet, you know, listen to your podcast. It, it'll be like um, Nathan and, and Corey and uh, sitting in a cave somewhere. <laughs> and they'll say, boy, Jesse called that wrong. <laughs> Yep. War will your face be red and yeah. melted, sadly. Yeah, I would like, I've had a real trouble being optimistic about what is a shift in a positive direction because it seems to come with so much paleo bullshit baggage. I mean, again, Trump dropped so many bombs, and the people who pretend to be non interventionist but love him. They, they ignore that because dude had some sweet, you know, burns at Dick Cheney a couple times. So he must be an anti-interventionist. Yeah. But just the whole vibe and the whole people sounding a little too okay with Vladimir Putin as an obvious shitty person who is obviously engaged in an interventionist war. You know, he's the U.S. Um, if, if it's the war in Iraq, he's the U.S. Yeah. and Ukraine is Iraq. You know, and like they need to acknowledge that. Are but. you saying that Zelensky is Saddam Hussein? Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, he's not as bad, but you know, <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. There's, you. there's <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, as always with um, in any anti war movement, there are people who um, have trouble. Um, they feel like that means they have to embrace the propaganda of the other side. And it's, but really there's some don't. wild horseshoes going on you with know, that lately. It, and that's, um, that's, you know, not good. Um. Well, as a libertarian, I feel like I get to choose between loving war and hating immigrants, <laughs> or loving immigrants and uh, loving war. Like those are my those are my those are the two camps that I am offered in uh, in general. Yeah, I, I have to, I have to say um, that um, reason has evolved increasingly anti-war over the years. It used to it's be true. the redoubt of hawkish libertarians, but with, uh, but with always space for the anti-war people to make their case is really, um, that's very, I mean, there's still a range of opinions made available within that broadly interventionist camp. But yeah. Reason has, um, um, arrived at this spot where we are um, pretty dovish and also good on immigration. And it's a, uh, we do not always get credit for that because, well, partly because there's um, people who like to pretend, you know, we're pro war when we're not, you know. Right. It's a, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a, uh, there is some hope out there for the full, because those are always like they're they're especially with like the right wing libertarians, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, they're always going to be either bad on immigration or bad on war. It felt like, um, well, we all collectively own the United States, you know, it's oh, yeah. like com communism. Like we all have to vote yeah. to see if the immigrants can come in. And I guess we voted and they can't, that's yeah. how it works. Uh, no, I will totally vouch for a reason. Um, my former employer and arch nemesis slash best magazine that um, since I've been paying attention, I have seen nothing but improvements on the war thing. And as far as I can remember, we're talking since I was a teen. So Bush, Bush time, uh, like Im the immigration thing. I think I asked you when we had dinner, if they were, if like, there was ever an anti-immigrant era at reason. And you said, not no, really. No, I don't so, think there ever was. Yeah. I mean, it, it, the history and foreign policy is more um, complicated. And, and like some weird eighties, like the Contras, everybody. Yeah, well, I mean, the cold, I mean, that's the thing. That one dude, that, that one dude, I forget. Uh, um, uh, Jack Wheeler. Yeah. He was, yes, exactly. Yeah. He, um, who then in the nineties, um, not in reason, got obsessed with the idea that, um, that uh well he had two ideas that janet reno was plotting waco 2 oh shit and <laughs> which was going to be this big crackdown on militias across the country and when that happened he said well you know obviously i sounded the alarm so it didn't happen and he was also obsessed with the idea that uh hillary clinton was a lesbian um oh no yeah that would be what was the bad about her yeah. not all the other stuff yeah but so but reason was um was more strongly hawkish in the cold war. Um, and after the cold war ended, um, although, uh, Virginia who became the editor, you know, is, is, um, came from that hawkish direction. 
the foreign policy issues that tended to, and in fact, you know, supported the first Gulf War. Um, oh, the, I missed that. I yeah. Think. The, um, the, um, Weird. the foreign policy questions that followed over the course of the decade, Somalia and the Balkan Wars. And mm-hmm. I don't, I may must have run something about Haiti. I don't remember it tended to be just tended on just um, pragmatic grounds, say this is a bad intervention. Um, mm-hmm. And then, um, by the time uh, 9-11 happened, um, Nick, who was much more anti-war, had become the editor. Um, so not quite enough for my taste. No, but, but... I mean, it was a different... Uh, and the um, and, he, and Nick was partly for his own... I mean, he would give you better than me, like a, a, an account of his um, reasoning. I will say that some of it had to do with sort of the institutional history of, of, of reason and so on. Um, was open to, did leave, have the pages of, and even more so sort of the pixels of reason open to people supporting the um, Iraq war. So you had um, a couple of staffers supporting it and you had Michael Young um, from the outside writing pro-war stuff. The staff was overwhelmingly opposed. Um, yeah. And and by the time it became clear what a um, disaster the Iraq war was, I think that there really wasn't much... Um, gumption left among the the hawks so um i mean of the people who were on staff who supported um the iraq war i mean like because i mean there are some people on staff now who had supported it then but didn't work for a reason i think mm-hmm. the only person who was on staff then who supported it who's still on staff now is ron ron bailey right that's was, what i thought i remember yeah, who that, will yeah. tell you he, he got it wrong you know that he learned yeah. from that mistake um so, you know, it, it's a, um, so there's been this sort of um, a, a, a gradual institutional um, evolution and it's sort of reached the point now where a lot of, um, you know, uh, conservatives who we are friendly with just in the sense mm-hmm. of just being actual friends with people, you know, we'll sort of see this as like one of the issues where we're liable to, um, to disagree with them, um, you know, and, and, and I mean the same way they would about, you know, legalizing sex work or whatever right so like people who yeah it's think- so but that's i mean but it's you know there's um there's a, still a variety of views of what non-intervention means i should say the june issue right. the one that we were talking about my oath keepers um story in has got a cover story by matt welch which is really good on um oh yeah he has had, he had some some bad moments on that issue, which I have sassed him about on many occasions. Well, he has an article um, making the case for, um, you know, the Ukraine war. You know, this is a European problem. This is the case. This is a chance for what, us to do what we should have done at the end of the Cold War and pull back as the United States and let, you know, you know, let Europe step up. And it's not a radical libertarian argument. Um it, but it's it's one that's very much sort of a pragmatic anti-interventionist um this and he has some order you know a lot closer ties to europe than your average american yeah. having lived there and and things so yeah him saying that i'd say means a little more than your average person well, it's very well informed piece i recommend people read it um so there's a yeah no so yeah matt on the iraq war was initially undecided on it um <laughs> And, and, and he says, and he'll say that's a regret. I mean, he regrets it the same way that Ron regrets having supported yeah. it. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, so that, that's, I, I don't, but I don't remember any point in which reason was bad on immigration, you know, the way, you know, the Lou Rockwell.com group is bad on immigration. <laughs> you know. Was, but, yeah. is, what will is, be forevermore. Be, yeah. There's a, and in fact, a lot of those folks have devolved since, you know, Ron Paul, if you look back on, this is crazy. If you look back at Ron Paul's <laughs> 1988 campaign, he's not quite there yet on foreign policy, but he's good on immigration. Oh my God. He's, he's sort of broadly anti-interventionist, but he's like willing to speculate about the idea. Well, maybe the U.S. could go to war in Cuba. You know, I mean, it's very, uh, I, if we had a declaration I do think he, Ron Paul might be one of those people like that I categorize, at least the way he tells it, like along with like Daniel Ellsberg and Edward Snowden, people who started off with really good impulses and then sort of tried to smother them 
in the cradle and like get a, you know, government s job or win an election and stuff. And eventually sort of their better natures tried to creep out some more. I don't know. Well, he, um, I mean, he got um, better on war stuff, although he was pretty good on war then still. But if you read yeah. the interview that the Bircher magazine, the new American did with him, he's like really kind of open to some stuff. It's like, no, 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 no that's not good. Um, but he was, <laughs> he got worse on immigration um, uh, since when he was the libertarian. I mean, like when you look at like the uh, debates about him being, um, the nominee in 88, um, the big mm. concern was, I mean, I should say 87 because that's when they had their convention. The big concern was his uh, stance on abortion because the party was much more fiercely pro-choice then. Oh, really? Um, and immigration didn't come up at all that I can remember. That's interesting. I don't think I knew that. Yeah. I mean, I know that um, Eric Garris of antiwar.com, he and the late Justin Raimondo protested Ron Paul. Oh yeah, they um, had they had buttons that said that "Gay time. Nazis for Paul." <laughs> um, and then, like, they sort of reconciled with him later. Um, but then, Raimondo, like everyone's favorite horrible paleo libertarian, and truly rest in peace. But um, there's a blog at anywhere.com from 2008 where Raimondo was complaining about Paul using a very anti-immigration ad, and then Raimondo, in his final years, got pretty awful on that issue um uh so yeah just the, the fluctuations he, he are kind of wild in that direction justin was before 2008 um i don't sure. remember that column but I mean, I mean, that was a weird fluke <laughs> I, I i think that column i i don't remember it in particular and maybe i didn't see it but presumably paul went too far for him and sure. something um but i i mean i've been told secondhand that in the 80s immigration was a big concern for him um yeah, he was um, he was like dating some guy from South Africa, and and I guess immigration and apartheid kind of moved up in the uh, in his pantheon of issues for a while. Um, yeah, way back that's, when. Yeah, that's weird. Um, no, but I, I was thinking of uh, old Romando again because I always thought his critique of reason, though he was over the traditionally over the top, um, that making like that they, they, they wouldn't debate the drug war. You know, there would there be no pro drug war peace in reason, yeah. which you know, good, correct. Um, but there would be even even a sprinkling, even a minority of pieces saying, "Let's have the war in Iraq," and that 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 being even sort of conceivable in libertarianism was was sort of a sign of the rot. I'm a little with him, but it's improved so much, and I've seen that. And there was always more to it, and more of it was based on who was mean to Murray Rothbard and. 1985 yeah in 1985 i think justin was being mean to murray <laughs> rothbard i think that was during their and he should have been meaner i don't know yeah. the 90s wouldn't have happened yeah but like, there's always more to it when you know i don't know i always assume it's all based on pure ideological philosophical high ideals i have seen a letter that murray rothbard wrote this was in like the files at of liberty magazine for some reason um my boss had copies of some correspondence between Murray Rothbard and I think it was Mike Holmes. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe it was someone else. I don't, I unfortunately don't have copies of this, but um, it was like from late eighties and Murray Rothbard was sort of bitching about Justin Raimondo because Justin had just moved over <laughs> to the Republican party. Um, and Murray was still, I say Murray as though I know him, Rothbard yeah. <laughs> was still in the um, Libertarian Party. He had not, he had, this was shortly before he went paleo. It would have been 87 mm -hmm. or 88. And he I, was, the year I was born, he went wrong. He, Coincidence. Yeah. So, you know, were you a Dukakis baby? But what was great in this, this, um, this uh, letter is that he sort of complains about uh, Justin um, getting involved with the Republicans and, and like the sort of stuff that Justin is in. And, and Murray Rothbard says, well, I'm committed to the Libertarian Party, but if I ever was to be, um, to join one of the major parties, I would join the Democrats. Oh, that's funny. And he, wow. he doesn't even say the Democrats. He says the democracy <laughs> with a capital D, the sort of old fashioned 19th century way. <laughs> And it was, boy, thing. And there is a Liberty <laughs> article. Liberty magazine ran a um, debate on um, 
on uh, the 88 election where they had someone mm-hmm. supporting not voting, I think. I don't remember if they had a mm-hmm. non-voter. They had someone saying vote Ron Paul. They had someone saying vote for Bush. And they had a pseudonymous piece making the case for Dukakis. And this <laughs> person behind the pseudonym she was, was shamed. Mar- the person behind the pseudonym was Murray Rothbard. Um, oh, and he, weird. And he was saying, How did I miss that one? He, he says, my- you know, vote for, uh, I'm for Ron Paul. I'm not saying yeah. you have to vote for Ron Paul, but if you want to see who is better between Bush and Dukakis, the answer is clearly Dukakis. And he goes through all these all these things. So it was um, right before he decided to veer in a different direction. In a so, very you know. David Dukean direction. Yeah. What a weird man that was. Yeah. Okay. Oh, my God. Okay, so that was really fun talking to Jesse Walker. Probably too fun, but... Um, I learned stuff, so I'm really hoping any listeners out there did as well. Mainly about Maoists, but also about other stuff. Um, you can follow me um, in the Elon Muskian Twitter lands on, uh, at Lucy Stag, L U C Y S T A G. You can follow the Non Servium um, Media Collective on a lot of different uh, platforms, including Twitter, which is my favorite, at Non Servium uh, Media, all one word. Um, you can follow Jesse on Twitter and you should because he tweets very interesting, frequently esoteric stuff that I kind of want to talk about and we didn't get to, but just follow him at. Oh, not Jesse Walker. (laughs) N O T J E S S E W A L K E R. Um, And his work is over at reason um, in the print magazine and on the website. And um, one of these days I'm going to read his book about radio because radio is fun. Um, But I can certainly first-hand vouch for the United States of Paranoia being really great, really insightful, and I'm going to reread it as well, so you should read it at least once, if not twice. Um, I believe that's all, but uh, Jesse, thanks so much for talking to me today. Thank you. Uh, It's been fun, as always. Alright, come back again sometime. You're listening to the Non-Servium Podcast enjoy this episode why not subscribe over on our youtube channel or your favorite podcast platform you can also follow us across social media on twitter facebook instagram and mastodon if you're extra interested in seeing this project continue consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com but if you can't contribute financially we still like you a whole lot and you can help us out just by liking and sharing this episode or any other one that catches your fancy as always, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience, helps keep this project alive. Thanks so much.